We're continuing with our discussion of the two primary food agencies, this time looking at the USDA, the Food Safety Inspection Service arm of that agency that's in charge of meat inspections. And we've uh, started our lecture by talking about the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, how it defined food and what jurisdiction it has. But it's really important to look at the second agency and also to see uh, further where the FDA jurisdiction is as we'll get into, the FDA takes care of basically everything that the USDA is not inspecting. So I encourage you, if you haven't already, to go ahead and listen to the FDA lecture first. That will also give you some administrative pieces about how lectures are going to work and, and some issues there and some information there. But uh, we'll continue now with our, our USDA discussion. So what we learned in the first lecture was it's always important to go back and start with the statute. The statute inevitably always contains a definition section that will tell you what authority that agency is going to have based on that statute. And what we saw with the FDA is it has a very broad focus. It has a single act, the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act, that has a very broad definition of food. And what we see in contrast here with the USDA is that it has a very narrow focus and actually it would not seem the case because it has three statutes that are its primary source of authority, a primary source of jurisdiction and food enforcement and food safety but each of these acts as we'll come to see in this lecture are fairly narrow and they provide a very focused uh, realm of jurisdiction for this agency to work in. Now I want you to remember the, we'll get into this more next week as we get into inspections and enforcement, but the dichotomy in the approaches used by these two agencies is so important. The USDA, remember, is operating on this continuous mandatory or compulsory inspection basis. The FDA operating on a random uh, inspection basis. There's no one in the facility. Uh, there's no one there to constantly be there on a day-to-day -day basis. So we'll kind of see how that continuous inspection model, that compulsory inspection model works for the USDA because of this narrow focus. So these are the three acts that we're going to work with. We've mentioned them before, the Federal Meat Inspection Act, Poultry Products Inspection Act, and Egg Products Inspection Act. If you've worked in uh, this area for a while, you're probably not surprised, but it still surprises me to see how old some of these statutes are. Yes, we have amendments that come through and update them, but for the most part, these are small amendments, and so it's pretty amazing to see uh, how we're operating under such um, old legislation when we know industry can change so quickly. So we started with this question with the FDA, what is food? And so we have to ask that question again in this lecture, and we're again focused on the USDA, and we know that the USDA generally works with meat, poultry, and eggs. So we have to ask ourselves, what are, what are meat and eggs? And, you know, again, this is feels a little like a silly question, again, like we have felt with asking what is food. Of course, we know what, what food is, but when we get into these technical definitions, we see that it's a little different than maybe we had originally thought. So the, the Federal Meat Inspection Act in Section 601J has a very long definition that I didn't want to include here, but if you if you want to look this up, it's 21 U.S.C. Section 601J, very long definition, and it identifies the animals that fall under that statute. And then as we'll get into, it sets a threshold or a criteria for what percentage of raw or cooked meat um, should be there. And, and the statute itself doesn't do that. That's actually something that the statute says is at the discretion of the secretary of the USDA. And as we'll see, there are some rules that have used that ambiguous statutory authority to then uh, say what percentage of meat is actually a meat product. But generally this statute says that the Federal Meat Inspection Act applies to cattle, sheep, swine, goats, horses, mules, and other equines. And that can be its carcass, its parts, any part of those animals in the slaughter or processing falls squarely within the uh, Federal Meat Inspection Act. It surprises some people to see that horses are in there. That's something that's been in the news as of late. Uh, last year, bringing horses, uh, horse production back online and some issues there. Uh, a 2001 order brought into that definition uh, 
uh, basically emu and, and some other large birds, these ratatites and squab. But that is the that is what we mean when we talk about meat generally. And we'll get into some more refinement of that in the slides that follow. The next question we have to ask, what is poultry? And the Poultry Products Inspection Act in uh, 453E and F give a definition of what is poultry and poultry products. And it, and it says very broadly that it's any domesticated bird. And so, the, again, once this statutory authority is very broad, typically the agency will come on and issue a rule to give more guidance to industry so that there is some uniformity about what's being inspected. And the USDA came in and said, we interpret domesticated bird to mean any domesticated chicken, turkey, duck, geese, and guineas. And so if you have your critical brain on, and, and this is something that lawyers love to do, is to pick every word in a statute or a rule apart, you can start to see a clue about where the FDA jurisdiction is going to pick up. The definition here is very specific, domesticated chicken, turkeys, and so on. So that can be a clue that if it's not a domesticated chicken, domesticated turkey, then it's more likely than not, and we'll get into this, uh, going to be the FDA jurisdiction and not the USDA. So that's how we generally define meat and poultry. We also have the Egg Product Inspection Act, and that in 1033G defines an egg to mean the shell of a domesticated chicken, turkey, so on. The, the same list of domesticated uh, poultry that we saw that would be fall under the, the products uh, also falls under the Egg Products Inspection Act. So we're looking at the domesticated chicken products, the hydrated eggs, frozen eggs, liquid eggs, those sort of things. A note here that, again, this isn't always as clear as we would like it to be and just to fit nicely in these great little boxes, but there's these areas of overlap and, and confusion, I guess. And so the USDA has the authority to grade eggs, and they do this with a number of things, and they, you see this grade A eggs or these different grades that you'll see, and that's the USDA's authority to do that. But the FDA is responsible for enforcing labels and labeling of the shell eggs. So where that distinction of how does the grade fit and the label and this overlap and this confusion, it's one of those areas that um, would make more sense perhaps if we had a single agency that was responsible for all components, but here we have this, this split that we talked about in the first lecture that was the result of some history. So I wanted to put up a chart that gets into this, and this is actually uh, from the Investigations Operations Manual for the FDA, and we'll talk about what that is in another lecture, but, but generally speaking, this manual is given to investigators of the Food and Drug Administration that are going to go out and do these inspections, and it tells them, here's your authority to inspect this, don't inspect this. You know, it lets them know what, what they have a right to inspection or what they should be inspecting and what they shouldn't. And, and I'll put this PDF up uh, in the uh, lecture materials if, if you want to look at it, but it basically separates out where is FDA jurisdiction for the most part and where is USDA jurisdiction. So I wanted to distill this into a chart uh, to give you a really clear sense of what jurisdiction the USDA has under these different acts. So we saw under the Federal Meat Inspection Act those different animals that we saw, cattle, sheep, swine, and so on. And I mentioned that there was a very broad provision in the, in the statute that said that the secretary of the USDA could set a percentage of what percent of that product had to be raw meat to qualify under the act, what percent had to be cooked meat to fall under the act, and so on. And, the, and what the USDA came up with under the Federal Meat Inspection Act, if it's more than 3% raw meat, more than 2% cooked meat, and 30% more of these components, fat, uh, tallow, and so on, then it, then it falls under the USDA uh, jurisdiction, the Food Safety Inspection Service authority to inspect. But if it's 2.8% or lower, 2.9, anything below that 3% for the raw and below the 2% for the cooked and below the 30%, then that's FDA territory. So even though it is a swine product, a goat product, and it's less than 3% raw meat, 
It's not going to be the USDA's authority. They've given that authority or decided not to take that authority, I guess, in some way and give it to the FDA. And we saw this example in the first lecture when we talked about sausage. The sausage meat itself was going to be a USDA meat product, depending on what meat it was here. We're assuming it's one of the meats under the act. And it was above the 3% raw or above the 2% cooked. But the casing itself had no nutritional value. It fell below this threshold for uh, the amount of meat that was in it. And so we saw that the casing itself ended up being uh, FDA territory, even though it could be made of these different components from under the act. And we have similar interpretations under the Poultry Products Inspection Act, uh, a little different numbers, 2% or more of cooked, and, and then we have this greater than 10% for the skins, giblets, and, and the fat. And then under the Egg Production, uh, Egg Product Inspection Act, we have this that processing plants themselves, as we discussed in the first lecture, fall under. So this outlines the USDA's territory. If it's not here, and there are some other areas where we get into uh, dairy products and so on, but for our purposes in this class, this is what we'll be discussing for the most part. And so if it's not here, it's not in the USDA territories. So for example, uh, bison. Bison's a very popular meat. It doesn't fall under the Food, uh, Federal Meat Inspection Act. It's not cattle, sheep, swine, so on. It's bison. That's going to be FDA territory. You can think of some other exotic meats that might uh, come to mind. Uh, kangaroo meat, uh, alligator meat, uh, things of those natures uh, are going to be under the FDA. And, and so if it's not on this list and it's not in the percentages, and, and the same with the uh, poultry products, wild turkeys, wild chicken, wild geese are not going to fall under this. So this gives you a very clear picture of where USDA territory is going to be, where you're going to be able to expect to see food safety inspection service inspectors in facilities doing that compulsory continuous inspection process. So I think it's real interesting to not only look at this, the technical statutory authority for what the FSIS has an authority to go and inspect and, and that jurisdictional line between the two agencies, the FDA and the USDA. I think it's also really interesting to look at how this agency came to be and what that can teach us about food law, how food law is made, what importance we put on certain areas of food production, and what we see in how compliance with the law plays out. And, and we'll get into some lessons into that once we complete the history. But if you remember from the first um, component that we had on the FDA, the 1906 Federal Meat Inspection Act originally came into the USDA, Pure Food and Drug Act also came in, and there, we had one, one sub-agency doing the Pure Food Act, and the Bureau of Animal Industry was in charge of the Federal Meat Inspection Act. This agency itself had been around since 1884, doing largely agricultural components, didn't really have a safety role that we would think of today, but it made sense for the Federal Meat Inspection Act to be enforced by this agency. And it stayed that way from 1906 until 1953 when President Eisenhower got rid of the BAI and it moved all of that's functions into the Agricultural Research Service, which was another sub-agency within the uh, USDA. And then it stayed that way for another almost 10 years before we had poultry inspections come in. And so we had poultry inspections merged with other meat inspections that we saw, um, beef, swine, and so on, merge into one uh, agency of enforcement. And that came into a, a new one, uh, Consumer and Marketing Service arm of the Agricultural Research Service. So right off the bat, you kind of get a sense of both the importance and the message to consumers about what this agency does. And it's, it's confusing. The Consumer and Marketing Service. It doesn't really tell you what the agency does. If I told you that there was an agency that is under the Consumer Marketing Service, would you expect them to be in charge of inspecting the safety uh, of the slaughter and processing of meat? Not necessarily. And to see that, you know, this 
bifurcation that existed between poultry and, and other meats and to see this merge together, that's a good thing. But, you know, what we see is a little bit of confusion about where it is in the agency and, and what role it, it's taking on. 1971, we get an agency that many of us will be familiar with, APHIS. At that time, uh, it was the Animal and Plant and Health Service Agency, renamed in 1972 to the name that we all know today. And APHIS is a part of the USDA that really comes into, uh, I typically see it on the import side, importing livestock or plants. And all the meat inspection authority agency components were put into APHIS. And that was the case for 1971 for about a year. And then in 1972, we get the Food Safety and Quality Service established and it took over all the meat inspection from APHIS. And so it's kind of surprising to see from 1906 to 1953 and then suddenly there's just almost rapid succession amount of changes. And it's it can be very difficult for an agency to build itself up in in that time when there's so much bureaucratic shuffling occurring. And so we see also, that for the first time, we get some real clarity about what this arm of the USDA is supposed to be doing, food safety and quality service. I get it. They're grading the quality of the eggs and meat. They're making sure that that meat is safe and making sure those uh, eggs are safe. That's a very clear uh, mission and very clear to the consumer about what this agency is supposed to do. And so the food safety and quality service is basically the forefather for what we have today, reorganized in 1981 and since then left alone. So finally, by 1981, we allow the agency to have a home to establish itself and to continue to do its mission rather than to continue to shuffle around. So what's the big deal? It's nice to look at the history. It's interesting to see what hidden lessons or what importance in policy we see coming from the Congress in this regard, but is there something else that we can learn? And I think not the, the, the main lesson that I see from this history is interesting to see what methods were used from 1906 and really, you know, the Bureau of um, Animal Inspection, the BAI, being there since 1884. But, you know, from the very minimum, from 1906 to 1993, and, and really until 1996, we had the same method of inspection being used, and it was this sight, touch, and smell inspection. Some of it is still used today, but it's not used solely. It's not the sole method of inspection anymore. And it, it was the only method of inspection for at least that 90 year period. Maybe if we could include um, the BAI functions earlier. It, it's amazing to think that that can be something that would last that long and not have any changes. But th that's how it worked. And it worked until we had the E. coli outbreak in 1993 in the Pacific Northwest, a very famous outbreak uh, in involving meat. 400 people were ill, four um, killed by the, the outbreak, and, and this finally led to a push, a big enough push to change uh, how these inspections are occurring and uh, to finally use a more objective, uniform method so that we can start to not have such a subjective approach uh, as this uh, sight, touch, and smell inspection. So what, is this, what does this history teach us about food law, food policy, and compliance? And for me, I, I use this as a lesson on both sides, FDA and USDA clients, that the law is so slow to change that often it does not keep pace with what is happening in the facilities, technology changes, changes in methods, uh, you know, if there are new diseases that we're identifying or strains of uh, known diseases that we're working with, the law does not keep pace with those. And so what we have to understand is that when we look at the regulations, we look at the statutes, the, the law is really providing a floor, it's providing a baseline of what we should be doing, but it isn't always enough to make sure that we're protecting the consumer and we protect the consumer in order to protect the brand. And so you see that this, um, that's why a lot of larger facilities will use a third party uh, organization like GFSI to, to reach a standard that's above what the law is currently requiring. 
and and then they catch up. The law will catch up to where that standard is, and then this, that agent, that third party group, may raise that bar again. And so that's that's such an important lesson to have that doing the bare minimum to pass an inspection, if it's with FSIS, if it's with the FDA, it may not be enough to not only protect the consumer and protect the brand, but as we'll get into later lectures, you know, doing the bare minimum does not necessarily protect you in litigation. So the third lesson that I, I see from this also is that the law only changes in response to crisis. It's, it's the only time we seem able to get the Congress or whoever we need's attention to make a change. The Federal Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act didn't pass in that, until 1906, and it was only a passage because of a movement created from an outcry from Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, which highlighted horrible conditions and atrocities that were occurring in the uh, industrialization of food. We see it here when we're changing uh, the way that the FSIS is inspecting meat. If it took 400 people getting sick. We see that with uh, the FDA finally uh, getting the statutory authority in the Food Safety Modernization Act following some very serious recalls of products. So that's something that we have to also see is that the law is going to change in response to crisis, so we don't want to be that baseline that it could potentially invite the crisis in. So this is generally the overview of the USDA, a little bit of its history and a little bit of its jurisdiction, and we'll get more into this as we get into the enforcement topics next week. And the third component that we'll have for this week, we'll get into an overview of the U.S. legal system and the uh, general sense of what our food law, food regulations are.